Um, up next, our last talk before our first break, we've got Francis Backhouse, an author coming from British Columbia, Canada, and she will be speaking on 37 million years and counting, a brief history of beavers. This time we'd like to welcome Francis. Okay, so um, I wanted to start by thanking uh, Mike and Scott for putting on this pioneering conference and I'm uh, really happy to be here from the uh, other coast. Um, and it's also great to see all of you here. Um, you know, in the past decade, I've really seen a, a, a great uh, flourishing of interest in beavers. Um, and beavers are just in the news uh, way more than they used to be um, 10 years ago. Um, you know, there's the, anytime a beaver walks into a bar, which they do sometimes, uh, walks into a, a dollar store, you know, there's the, the videos on, uh, the, uh, on all your social media. Um, but they're, they're also in the news in, in other ways. And it's because beavers, of course, are becoming more numerous, populations are growing. They're also spreading into the areas where we live, our cities and towns um, and our suburbs. So this awareness is growing. Um, so I am going to get to the beavers of today, but I'm going to go uh, way back in time and uh, talk about 37 million years. Um, I think it's really important to have a historical perspective. It uh, allows us to put the, the present into context and also to make good choices for the future, um, looking back into history. Uh, of course, that applies to a lot more than beavers, but um, certainly applies to beavers. Um, so I've got the 45 minutes to cover 37 million years. Obviously, I'm going to move pretty quickly, um, pause at some key points, and uh, leave some time for some questions at the end, if anyone has any. So um, the beaver family, Castoroid, Castoroid I, and I know that uh, some of this is going to be review for a lot of you, um, old news, um, new for some people. Um, so the beaver family has been around for 37 million years ago, and it's a, a family of animals that started here in North America, um, then later moved over to Europe and Asia, and then moved back into North America. Um, over this 37 million years, there's been uh, a few uh, dozens of uh, different species that have come and gone, and they've been a very diverse bunch as well. Um, so the largest of the beavers, uh, extinct beavers, was uh, more than 60 times bigger than the smallest, and they have a range of, of lifestyles. Um, so for example, um, the most famous of the beavers of the past is the giant beaver. Um, Castoroides. Um, so how big was the giant beaver? Well, this is a, a reasonably uh, good full-size model standing there with me up in uh, Whitehorse in the Yukon. Um, the typical adult modern beaver is about three feet long um, and about 35 to 70 pounds. The, the giant beaver was about three times as long, um, nearly nine feet long from, from nose tip to, to tail tip. Um, at least twice as heavy, um, probably up to about 220 pounds. So these were big guys. Um, but they didn't cut wood, and they didn't build dams. Um, they ate pond weeds. Um, ecologically, they were more like hippos than what we know of beavers today. And um, so they were around for a long time, up till about 10,000 years ago, which means that they actually overlapped with our modern beavers, Castor canadensis, that we know today. Um, and al they also overlapped with the first humans in North America. So there are actually indigenous stories that, that trace this very, very ancient memory of uh, living with giant beavers. Um, in contrast to Castoroides, um, we have Paleocaster. Um, so these beavers were around uh, about 22 million years ago. Um, they were the size of prairie dogs, and they had a very similar lifestyle to prairie dogs. Um, like a lot of primitive beavers, they were actually burrowers. Um, and they lived in the area that's uh, now Nebraska, uh, Wyoming, South Dakota. Um, and what set them apart from some of these other underground burrowing beavers is these amazing um, tunnels they, they made, which spiraled straight down for two to three meters down to their, their dens below. 
Um, and we know about these burrows because they filled up with uh, sand and the sand hardened and they created tr what are called trace fossils. So there's fossilized um, uh, Palocaster burrows um, in places like Agate Fossil Beds uh, National Monument. So in the, the cliffs of the river, you can actually see these spiral burrows. And um, they know that they were inhabited by beavers because they found the skeletons of some of them in the, the uh, little burrows at the bottom. So neither of these two were woodcutters. As I said, Castoroides ate aquatic plants. Uh, Paleocaster uh, most likely ate grasses, herbaceous plants. Um, and until uh, the 1960s, um, only the modern beavers were known to be woodcutters. And um, where, where that knowledge changed with, with Dipoides, which lived uh, between about five and two and a half million years ago. So these beavers were about two-thirds of the size of our modern beaver, and uh, these bones here, you can see by the, the hand of the person holding them, they're pretty small bones. Um, they were dug up in, from peat deposits on Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic. And so you might think, what were beavers doing in the high Arctic? Well, the climate was very different then. Um, it was much more like the uh, northern boreal forest um, in terms of the climate and the fact that there were trees around. And what amazed people when they dug up the, these bones was that there were also pieces of beaver cut wood found with them. Um, which were about four million years old, and, and many pieces, more than 100 pieces of these sticks with little tooth marks on it, on them. Um, different sized teeth than our modern beavers, they match the teeth of these uh, fossils. Um, and this was a game changer. It shed new light on beaver evolution um, because these sticks are the oldest known examples of beaver cut wood, four million years old. Um, <coughs> And the only ones from any beaver family outside of um, the castor genus, the, the modern beavers. But uh, dipoides and castor beavers are, d castor is not um, a direct descendant of dipoides. These beavers are very distantly related. And evolutionary theory tells us that a behavior like tree cutting is not likely to show up independently in two widely um, separated groups of animals, what's likely is that they had a common ancestor and that they both de descended from that ancestor who chewed wood. So then the question is, who was that common ancestor? Um, and so a paleobiologist, Canadian paleobiologist Natalia Rybczynski, um, traced back through the beaver family tree, and she had to go back all the way 24 million years to find that common ancestor between Dipoides and Castor, which means that woodcutting, or, or tree exploitation as she calls it, um, is probably about 24 million years old as a, a behavior. And that's significant because uh, whenever beavers started cutting wood, is likely when their career as, as ecosystem engineers, or possibly when, when it started. We don't know exactly when they started building dams. There were structures found with the Dipoides uh, fossils that look suspiciously like dams. They can't say for sure. Um, as scientists, they're, they're cautious about saying these are dams, um, but they very likely are dams. Um, so, so 24 million years ago, um, beavers may have started their career as ecosystem engineers. Um, so hold that thought while we uh, fast forward to today. Um, today, there's only two beaver species, uh, Castor canadensis here in North America and Castor fever in Europe and Asia. Now, Duncan and Gerhard are going to be talking about castor fever after the break, so I'm not going to say anything more about the Eurasian beaver. Um, I'll focus on uh, castor canadensis. The two species diverged about a million years ago, and they're almost indistinguishable in terms of their appearance, uh, in terms of their behavior. Uh, what makes them separate species is a different number of chromosomes, 
and some fairly subtle um, morphological differences. So things like the dimensions of the tail, uh, the volume of the skull, uh, the size of the nasal openings on the skull. Um, but if I had two of them sitting here on the stage with me, it, you'd be pretty hard pressed to, to tell one from the other. Um, that'd be quite cool if we could have a live beaver here. Um, so all of the beavers found in North America belong to the same species. Um, it's one of the most widespread mammalian species in North America. And you can see um, that they have a, a huge range. So um, at the time when uh, Europeans showed up in North America, around 1500, uh, this was the range of Castor canadensis from here on the Atlantic coast over to where I live on the Pacific coast from south of the Rio Grande River in northern Mexico, uh, right up to the Arctic tree line. And in fact, following rivers like the Mackenzie River that goes up to the Arctic Ocean uh, with lots of willows along the river, um, their range extends right up to the Arctic Ocean in places like that. Um, so until humans showed up, um, beavers were the dominant ecosystem engineer in this continent and all over this continent. Um, so humans came to North America at least 15,000 years ago um, and, and our relationship with beavers goes back a long way. Um, because beavers were so widespread and um, the, there were many, many different indigenous people who lived within the range of the beavers. Um, there's many variations on how that relationship played out. And so I'm wary of making broad generalizations, uh, but there are some common themes to how that relationship generally uh, played out. Uh, one is that pretty much wherever beavers occurred within um, the human range, uh, humans hunted them. Uh, for, for food and for fur primarily. So the, the meat uh, was very nutritious. Um, the fatty tails were an extremely important source of, of fat for people um, during the winter months, especially the farther north you went in North America. Um, and other body parts were used as well. So uh, teeth, uh, they, just as they make great chisels for the beavers themselves, um, Indigenous people used them as, as chisels as well. I've seen um, neat little things where a piece of the jaw with the teeth is, is lashed onto a stick and, and used as a, a chisel for carving uh, wood for snowshoes from the Dene up in uh, northern Canada. Um, some, some indigenous groups used the teeth as dice. They, they carved on the sides of the, the teeth, uh, particularly the Coast Salish um, out on the west coast and uh, use these for gambling dice. Uh, things like the, the nails were used uh, decoratively, kind of like sequins. Um, so another commonality was that the, the hunting was done sustainably. There was great respect for the beavers, um, a, a completely different uh, world view about the relationship between human and, and non-human beings. Um, so this was reflected often in uh, rituals associated with the bones of beavers that had been killed. Um, quite a few indigenous groups had um, rules about the bones had to be burned or put into trees so dogs couldn't eat them because that would be disrespectful to the, the beavers. Um, another common thing was that the bones be returned to the water um, so that the beavers could be reborn. Um, the, the Blackfeet are interesting because they did not hunt beavers. Beavers had um, great religious significance for the beaver. Uh, beavers had great religious significance for uh, the Blackfeet. They are part of their origin story um, as they are for a number of other indigenous groups. And so even in the fur trade when there was a lot of pressure for indigenous people to be hunting beavers, uh, the Blackfeet said, no, um, we're not doing that. Um, beavers are also clan animals for um, a number of indigenous groups, um, such as the Haida, um, who carved this um, pole that's shown here. So that was the relationship for a long time. Uh, started to change when Europeans showed up around 1500. 
So back in the Middle Ages, um, Europeans had figured out that beaver fur felted um, is a fantastic material for making hats. Um, it makes very durable felt um, and very water resistant. And so um, before the invention of the umbrella, having a water resistant hat was a, a very useful thing. Um, so there was a lot of hunting uh, of beavers for hats. Um, before that, even uh, cast for the, the meat, uh, for castorium. Um, all of this added up to the fact that by 1500, uh, Europe had almost no beavers. Uh, they had been pretty much exterminated. So then Europeans uh, arrived in North America, found this continent that was brimming with beavers, and pretty quickly people realized that there was commercial potential here. So they, they actually came for the cod and the whales, uh, but they stayed for the beavers. So um, how many, and, and then the, 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 the uh, transatlantic fur trade was in full swing by the, the mid 1600s. It, it took a few decades to ramp up. So how many beavers were there in North America in 1500? Well, of course we, we don't really know. Uh, but we get a sense of just how ubiquitous and how numerous they were um, from the words of those who did see them or um, came soon after their numbers started to de decline. So uh, David Thompson, a great Canadian uh, fur trade map maker who traveled all over the continent, he wrote that previous to the discovery of Canada, this continent from the latitude of 40 degrees north to the Arctic Circle and from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean may have been said to have been in the possession of two distinct races of beings, man and the beaver. Man was lord over all the dry land, while all the lowlands were in possession of the beaver and all the hollows of the higher grounds. So in other words, beavers were everywhere. Um, there are some actual numerical estimates, uh, but they, they range pretty widely. So. Uh, ranging from 60 million to 400 million beavers um, at the time of uh, European arrival on the continent. It's a pretty wide range, but we uh, do know that there were at least tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of beavers here at that time. Um, by the start of the 20th century, uh, we had pretty much purged beavers from the continent. Um, they were completely absent from most of their range, very rare in other parts. Uh, total number of survivors is estimated to have been in the low hundred thousands. And so that's less than 1% of the most conservative estimate of the number of beavers at the time that Europeans had arrived here. Um, a story to uh, illustrate just how rare they had become. So in 1843, uh, John James Audubon, the great wildlife painter, uh, was working on an illustrated book about mammals of North America. And this is the, the painting that he did of the beaver. Well, the reason this is not quite anatomically correct is that he didn't have an actual beaver to use as a model. Um, in his research for this book, he spent eight months traveling uh, nearly 3,000 kilometers up the Missouri River uh, looking for animals to, to uh, paint. He did not see a single beaver in that time. So this had been earlier in the 1800s, it had been prime beaver trapping uh, country. Uh, by 1843, when he was traveling there, he did not see a single beaver. He had a skilled trapper with him. Um, that trapper was not able to catch a single beaver for him. So he was uh, working um, from perhaps some, some stuffed beavers from people talking about them. Um, so most of this loss uh, of the beaver population happened over three centuries and compared to a million years um, that Castro Canadensis had been around, uh, 300 years is not very long. So how did we manage to decimate such a huge number of animals in such a relatively short time? So the recipe for this near extinction has three main ingredients. Um, the first one is geography. 
Um, the fur trade developed as a rolling frontier. So it started here on the East Coast, very close to here, um, and it just rolled north and west and south across the continent. Um, this graph uh, show, or sorry, this illustration here shows you know the movement northwards, uh, westwards, and and not so much down into the south, um, but certainly beavers were being trapped everywhere. And so um, it was just like a, a steamroller. The, the trappers wiped out every beaver in an area and then they moved on. This was one of the, the reasons so many could be uh, killed in such a short time. Uh, second thing was uh, psychology. So. The early fur traders sometimes called beavers brown gold, and there was a gold rush mentality to how the trapping took place. It was a, a feeling of if I don't grab these pelts, someone else is going to. So there's no point leaving any behind because they're going to be taken, so we'll just get them while we can. Um, early on, there were, there were no constraints. There were no conservation incentives. Um, not until the 1800s was anyone actually trying to put any controls on the trapping, and at that point, it, they were not very effective. Uh, so geography, psychology, and technology. Um, early on, Europeans relied on the hunting and trapping expertise of their indigenous partners. Um, so the technology at that point was nets, spears, wooden traps, uh, very effective technology that had been developed over a long time. Um, but it was technology that gave beavers a fighting chance. Uh, the Europeans then started to import steel traps, then started to um, make the steel traps um, in North America. Now, at first, those traps were, um, they were very heavy to carry around. They were prone to breakage when they got cold. So in northern areas, um, they, they often broke. But in 1823, um, a teenager, 17-year-old uh, from New York, C.O.L. Newhouse, invented a better trap. And by the 1860s, his trap had be, had, was into mass production it was a light, efficient, inexpensive steel trap. And as these traps spread out um, over the continent, the, the slaughter accelerated. And this really kind of put the, the nail in the coffin for beavers. So this graph um, gives us, uh, shows us the progression of the fur trade based on the average annual harvest of beaver pelts in North America. So. Um, People went through all the records, and we have this, you know, because of the um, economic importance of beaver pelts, there's great records of, of how many were being sold. And so we can see that, so it starts in the 1600s, and I think it's probably a little hard for some of you at the back to see, but here we are at the, the around 1610, and although there's, um, some some variations because of wars and politics. Generally, we have um, this increase up until the 1790s, and then it drops right off, heading towards uh, 1900. By 1900, uh, a lot of people thought that beavers were actually just going to go extinct. Um, Horace T. Martin, who wrote a, a wonderful book called Castrologia, which was uh, published in 1892, um, he gloomily predicted that as to the ultimate destruction of the beaver, no possible question could e ex exist. Now, a surprising thing, um, going back to that same graph, um, is what happened after 1900, this, this terrible low point for beavers. Um, so after 1900, um, we see this spike in the number of pelts um, going up here to the 1980s, where more beaver pelts were sold um, than at any other time in what we think of as the fur trade era, um, close to a million. Um, the, the market for top hats, which had really driven the, the fur trade, had completely collapsed, but pelts were being used for all kinds of clothing, trim, um, other kinds of hats. Um, 
including uh, things like uh, something very different than what we think of it as a, a beaver felt hat. Um, this was a genuine beaver soleil coronet, which was made in Czechoslovakia for um, a prestigious uh, Parisian label, the Chiraparelli label in the 1960s. This was a beaver hat. Okay, so we know that uh, not only did beavers not go extinct, um, that their, their recovery is actually one of the greatest uh, North American conservation success stories. And as with the downfall of the beaver, this, this comeback um, has sort of three things that led it. One of them uh, was regulatory changes. So after a long time of this free-for-all trapping, um, governments finally started to put some controls on how trapping was done. And this was prompted in large part by public demand, um, led by advocates um, like this man, um, Archibald Bellaney, Bellaney um, better known as Grey Owl, who was really uh, North America's first uh, strong, uh, outspoken advocate for beavers. Um, in addition to regulatory changes, there was the, the beavers' own capacity for resilience. So once trappers stopped killing every beaver in sight, they actually had the biological capacity to recover, uh, based especially on two things. One of them is uh, density-dependent reproduction. So beavers, um, if there's a lot of food, they can have larger litters. Um, typical litter size is about two to four, but um, they can have as many as nine kits in one litter. So as uh, they started to bounce back uh, where, where the food was there, the, the numbers grew rapidly. The other thing was uh, juvenile dispersal. So um, beavers uh, leave home at age two or three and they spread out across the land. And they can travel a long way. They can travel up to 30 kilometers, 50 miles. Um, and so, so they were able to very quickly move back into the areas where they had been wiped out. However, there were some really big gaps on the map. And it would have taken generations for beavers to get there under their own steam, moving 50 miles, 50 miles each generation. And so the third thing was um, that we gave them a helping hand. Um, reintroduction programs started putting beavers back into areas that they had been wiped out from, and this supplemented the natural dispersal. And so with these three um, things acting in combination, the, the regulatory changes, the uh, natural resilience, and the reintroductions, um, we now have thriving beaver populations in many areas, um, particularly in many parts of Canada. Um, but beavers are still not as abundant as they were in 1500. Um, again, we don't know exactly how many there are. The most recent uh, scientific as estimate uh, is from the year 2000, and again, it's a pretty wide range, 10 million to 50 million. Um, so someday, you know, maybe we'll get out there and actually count them, but they're not an easy animal to count considering how widespread they are, how many remote areas they live in. So what we do know is that they're still absent from places. They are still very scarce in some places, and they are very abundant in some places. Um, so that uh, brings us up to the present. Um, what does this 37 million years of beaver history uh, mean to us today? Well, for me, it highlights several things. Um, we know that Castor Canadensis has been building dams and influencing landscapes and North American hydrology for at least a million years. We know that Dipoides uh, was cutting wood and possibly, be, possibly building dams back four million years ago. We know that their common ancestor may have started this whole ecosystem engineering thing as far back as 24 million years ago. So whatever the timing, uh, beavers have profoundly shaped this continent for a very long time. Even if it's only a million years, but think of the possibility of four million years or 24 million years ago. Um, and when we kicked beavers off the job site um, back in the 17, 1800s, um, there were significant impacts on the landscapes and the waterways due to 
erosion, movement of silt, the amount of water being held, the groundwater supplies, all of those things which you're going to hear more about over the next uh, couple of days. So that's one thing that history means to me. Um, another is that um, eliminating beavers, of course, hurt ecosystems and species um, all across the continent. Um, they are a keystone species, as I'm sure you all know, um, and reducing their numbers had significant impacts on all kinds of um, plants and animals, um, insects, fish, amphibians, birds, mammals, um, a wide range of, of plants. Um, this history also highlights that um, the fact that most European settlement was happened in the absence of beavers. So there was this rolling fur trade frontier and the settlement came after it. So most of our European understanding of this continent came after beavers were already removed from the landscape. And that really skewed our perception of what natural ecosystems um, look like and how they function. Um, it also delayed our scientific study of this animal. Uh, because they simply weren't there to study. Um, so one example of that comes from um, the, the West Coast, um, this biologist Greg Hood, who in the early 2000s, so not that long ago, um, rediscovered the fact that there were beavers living in tidal marshes on the, the Washington coast, and that they were providing um, essential habitat, critical habitat for salmon fry. This is knowledge that would have been common knowledge to the people that lived there before Europeans showed up. Um, but with the removal of, of beavers, um, the, the ecosystem role was lost and the, the knowledge of that was lost. Um, history also tells us that the problem is not actually that there are too many beavers. It's that while we were absent, we humans took over uh, much of their habitat. And once we took it over, we paved it, we drained it, we built on it, um, and otherwise rendered it unfit for beavers. So even in the places that are still habitable for beavers, and there's far fewer of them now than there were, um, even in those places, we, we are often at odds with how we're going to use that land, how it should be managed. So we have um, two ecosystem engineers uh, with competing ideas. Um, finally, the takeaway for me uh, from this historical overview is that beavers are incredibly resilient and they are not going away. Um, so it's increasingly clear that we have a lot to gain by having them around as, as habitat makers, as water stewards, um, as community builders. Um, and so we need to figure out how to coexist. They're here, we're here, how do we get along? Um, I know coexistence, um, that living with beavers is not always easy, um, but we, we also know that the benefits uh, far outweigh the challenges. So it's the, the tension between those benefits and those challenges that's really brought everyone um, here to this conference, I think. And uh, so as you listen to the upcoming presentations, as you watch Sarah's film tonight, um, as you go back out to your particular work with beavers, I hope you'll keep this, this long view, this 37 million year view in mind. So uh, we uh, have time for some questions. Um, I'm also happy to talk during the breaks and also after the conference, if you wanna get in touch with me, uh, you can get in touch with me by email, through my website, uh, through my Facebook page. Um, I'll also uh, put in a little plug for the fact that I'm going to have a book about uh, beavers written for middle graders, young, young teens coming out next spring. So watch the... Uh, my social media for information about that. Um, yeah, and are there any questions? Okay, so the, the question, um, a really interesting question, that um, the, the uh, near extinction of the beavers happened fairly recently. Um, there would have been a, a great reduction in genetic uh, diversity because so many of them were wiped out. Um, does this put them at risk now? Um, this is not a question I've actually thought about before. Uh, it's a really interesting question. There doesn't seem to be um, 
I'm not aware of that having any effects, but I'd be actually interested to know if anyone in the audience has any um, answer to that question. Maybe someone who's more familiar with uh, beaver genetics. Uh, yeah, so, the, so then the question of, of climate change. Um, in fact, beavers are, are uh, responding to climate change by expanding their, um, their range up into, as, as trees move uh, farther north, um, then the beavers are moving as well. Um, I, I think really the thing with beavers and climate change is that they are much more of a, a potential ally for us in dealing with climate change. Um, they have some challenges, but with their uh, great resilience, I, I think they're, they're adapting reasonably well, as well as, as anyone could. Um, any thoughts on the genetics question? Um, okay, so so for those of you on the other side of the room who couldn't hear that is, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers, although low, were still large enough to support genetic diversity. I imagine there's about 25 subspecies of uh, Castor canadensis. Um, I don't know if any subspecies were considered completely extirpated um, or whether there were always a, a few that hung on. Um, other questions? Yeah, so good question about Castoroides, the giant beaver, what was their role in um, dam construction and, and then the, the various uh, native stories about uh, giant beavers, water monsters. So um, they did not build dams, um, they, they didn't build lodges, they were doing nothing with wood. Uh, but there are these really interesting indigenous stories um, about uh, the formation of the Great Lakes, about the formation of Flathead Lake in Montana being attributed to giant beavers. Um, so I think there's this very, this uh, deep memory of the fact that there were these very large beavers and so when flood events happened, um, there were stories that were developed that incorporated these beavers in those stories, but um, the, there's no, there was no dam building by giant beavers. Mm -hmm. Okay, the question is, um, are today's beaver harvests uh, well managed and sustainable? Um, so uh, there's a lot of different jurisdictions across that that, that covers. Um, so well, well managed and sustainable are perhaps two different. I'll, I'll talk about the sustainable part. Um, I would say that in in the parts of Canada that I'm more familiar with, uh, beavers are in no at no risk of being wiped out by the trapping. So there's there's all kinds of other considerations with trapping, ethical considerations, um, and so on. But in terms of the impact on very well established populations. Um, I think it's uh, minimal, but then there's other populations that are much more tenuous that I would say it, it can have a, an impact on them. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on the, the trapping side of things. Um, and I'd say it, it's very variable by jurisdiction, yeah. Why did they have the big teeth? Um, well, their teeth were, they don't have, didn't have that chisel edge. They were actually more blunted teeth. Uh, so, you know, they're kind of a typical rodent tooth in a way. Um, they were, pro they ate these pond weeds and things. I think they were just sort of good at grabbing that aquatic vegetation, but they weren't, didn't have that chisel edge that our, our modern beavers have. What's their advantage? Yeah, well, I mean, that goes to the, the, the whole uh, wildlife management um, uh, paradigm that <laughs> that we operate under here. So, <laughs> big philosophical question. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that was uh, I, I, you probably heard the question, but but why, um, given the historical perspective, um, is there still um, fisheries biologists to think that fish and beavers can't get along. And I would say actually British Columbia, where I live, there is still a lot of conflict between fisheries biologists and people um, trying to maintain beaver populations. There's, a, there's still a, a thinking that um, beaver dams need to be breached for the, the fish to get through and things like that. Um, it seems like organs may be a, a rarity on that. Um, it's, 
why? Uh, I, I think it's, it's part of that ecological amnesia that uh, a lot of that fishery biology was developed in the absence of beavers and, and people are, are need to, are, are still catching up with understanding what's going on in natural ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's very complex and I actually, uh, I know Glynis Hood has um, done a great literature review gathering all of the uh, literature, scientific literature on uh, fish and beavers um, and so she's probably a better person to ask that question to and I don't know if she wants to answer it now or whether that'll come up in your talk. Maybe? Yeah, you can ask Glynis later. Thank you so much.